This is Hillary Winston, and you're watching the TV Writer Podcast. Hosted by Gray Jones, the TV Writer Podcast is brought to you by Script Magazine and ScriptMag.com, the leading source for script writing information in print and on the web. This is Gray, and I'm here with producer writer Hillary Winston. How are you doing, Hillary? Good. And you are the showrunner and creator of the new show, Bad Teacher on CBS, which is Thursdays at 9.30. Yep. And, uh, and of course, we urge everybody to see that. Also, you're an author, and you have sold many pilots. And uh, so I think people are going to love this interview today. And as well, I do want to congratulate you. You just signed your fourth overall deal with Sony? I did, yeah. And it's making me feel very old. <laughs> also, <laughs> very being cool. six months pregnant makes me feel very old. But. Yeah. Well, well, congratulations. Four in a row. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> and, uh, and so we're going to follow three parts in the interview. One part is, of course, how you broke into the industry and catch me up to this point. The second part, we'll be talking about bad teacher. And then third, everybody loves this, tips on writing, on the room, on writing a pilot, all that kind of fun stuff. Great. So you grew up in Corpus Christi, didn't you? I did, yes. Yeah. Have you heard of it before this moment? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have, even though I actually just moved here from Canada, but I have oh, okay. heard of Corpus Christi. <laughs> um, but you left Corpus Christi to go of all places, to the White House. Uh, yeah. Tell me about that. <laughs> um, you know, I always thought that I was going to be the first uh, woman president. Um, it doesn't look like that's going to happen. <laughs> um, but uh, so, you know, I went to school in Washington, D.C., and I was just really politically ambitious. And so right away, my freshman year, right after I turned 18, I started interning at the White House. Wow. And it was pretty exciting. Um, and I just thought, like, I was in the West Wing, and I would see all these amazing people come by and, you know, seeing the president at different events, they would kind of shuttle you out for, like, the Easter egg roll and different things. And all of a sudden, like, the president of Uruguay would be landing in a helicopter on the lawn, and you would have to go out there and wave the Uruguayan flag. <laughs> and um, so it was really it was really fun, and especially knowing where I was going to end up. Uh, it was such a different world. I'm glad I got to experience that. Very, sure. very cool. And you studied at, at George Washington University? Yes. Yeah. And what did you study at that point? I studied international affairs, which other than the occasional like Habsburg Empire joke, I don't really use, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, in my day-to-day -day life. Uh, but my parents have finally gotten over it and <laughs> uh, I think are, are okay now with me not doing anything related to that. Yeah. Well, it does seem like a lot of people in comedy are very well learned, if you want to call it that, they studied other things which do inform the comedy. So now you did um, get involved in a comedy improv group at that point? I did. So when I was in college, I joined a sketch comedy group, Recess, and it's actually an amazing story now of how I ended up in it. I was a summer orientation leader, and I we were working on some sketches, you know, where it's like, this is how to be a bad roommate, and <laughs> that kind of stuff. And one of my best friends in that was an orientation leader with me was Carrie Washington, who's the star of Scandal wow. and, and a million other things. And she was like, you know, I think you're really funny. I, I you know, I think you kind of have something and there's this group called recess on campus that is sketch comedy and improv and I think that you would be you know a really good part of it and you should audition and I was like I'm not I know like I'm into politics and I'm not an actress and I wouldn't be good at that and and she was like no I'm telling you that you know you really should do this and so that fall I auditioned and I got into recess and it changed my life and then I fell in love with comedy and it's just funny now that I owe it all to Carrie Washington <laughs> Wow. Wow. Very cool story. <laughs> now, um, d was it at that point that you decided that you wanted to be a writer? Um, you know, I think that I really toyed with, uh, you know, Growing up in kind of like a you know a small town, it was like there were two occupations. You kind of became a doctor or a lawyer, and you know, or maybe you owned your own business, or you know. But it was just the idea of kind of becoming a writer, especially a comedy writer, just didn't seem like a real possibility. So I, you know, even in school, even though it was clear that in my classes, like playwriting was where I really excelled. I had an amazing mentor um, at GW in playwriting, but I thought, oh, I should go to law school. I do something serious. So after school, I worked at NPR. Um, you know, as a research assistant and worked in the library and I thought, well, maybe I can like merge writing and um, journalism and that's more serious. That seems like a real career. And then I was like, I don't want to, you know, report on things that are happening. I want to make things up. And so that's when I started kind of plotting my transition to Hollywood and, um, you know, found out about an internship program at the TV Academy. 
um, and they have one in TV script writing and you could do it even up to a year after having graduated from college. And I got Susan Stamberg at NPR, who is one of the founding members of NPR, um, to write me a recommendation and it was amazing. And that's how it all, it all came to be. Wow, wow, so, so you moved to Hollywood? I did. So I got the internship and they placed me at Star Trek Voyager. Wow. The hit comedy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I started working on that show and you know, it was such an amazing staff. And at that time, Brian Fuller was on staff as a staff writer. Um, it was run by Brandon Braga, who then later created Flash Forward, which was just an amazing show. It's devastating to me that it only lasted a season. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the freelance writers who had also done my internship program was Rob Darty, who created Elementary. Wow, wow. Very yeah, which cool. I'm a huge fan of too. And so Bad Teacher, which I know we're talking about in the second half, mm -hmm. but is going to be on Thursday nights at 930 and Elementary is on at 10. And uh, on at 8 is The Millers created by Greg Garcia, who gave me my first, uh, you know, primetime writing job. So it's kind of like an exciting like night for me. Of, wow, yeah. wow. That, 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 that's pretty neat. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so, was it smooth sailing from, uh, from Star Trek on and in, or were there some rough patches? Tell me about sort of the next few years. You know, it's, it's interesting, like I, when people tell those stories of like kind of they came out here and then it was just like charmed and all of a sudden everything happened for them, I don't relate to that at all. I mean, I, you know, got this internship program and I had to write my first spec script, um, which was, you know, really a great part of this program. I mean, when you first submitted it, you had to submit one scene. And so I wrote one scene and then they asked for the whole script and then I had to write the rest of the scenes around the script but it was such great training and then you know it helped get me into the world but I was so far from actually being a writer or even if somebody had hired me I wouldn't have known what to do mm. so then I started working as an assistant at Warner Brothers I worked for David um, Wolper's company and he had done like Roots and Thornbirds and his son Mark Wolper who created shows like Bullshit um, on Showtime and you know he did miniseries and movies we did like Mist of Avalon for TNT and I just, you know, used that desk to learn the lingo, learned about the agencies, just learned about how the world worked. Mm. And um, then I went to two other assistant jobs after that. I worked on Hollywood Squares oh, wow. <laughs> with Whoopi Goldberg. Yeah. Um, and I also worked on the Aspen Comedy Festival. And um, I worked for another development executive. And it was at every one of those jobs that you start to pick up on why people's careers last you know, why people will like, there were all these writers that came in, oh, this hot new writer, and then they would disappear two years later. Mm. And you started to see like what, you know, what it really took to kind of be, have a lasting career in the business. And, you know, I took all that stuff. And then when I was taking Groundlings classes at Groundlings Theater in LA, mm. I met somebody who was a writer on South Park. She said, my agent's assistant is being promoted and he's looking to read people. Mm. And you know, it was really exciting opportunity. She read my stuff before she gave it to him. But, you know, he was still an assistant. He was still answering phones and stuff, I think, when he was reading my material. Mm. But it's the best thing I ever did because instead of me being like, oh, I'd really love to go with a more senior person or something, his career has grown with my career. He's now a partner at UTA. He's one of my best friends. And every success I've had has earned his success, you know? Wow. And we've just been linked. And his first three clients, one is Jenna Bands, who's a scandal writer, mm -hmm. um, who's just really so unbelievably talented who also had a had her own show on ABC off the map and her husband Justin Spitzer who also is an office writer who just really is incredibly talented mm -hmm. and you know the three of us have you know really worked with our agent and helped him and become you know where he is and you know where we are and it's just was such an exciting feeling and at that time I think people would have thought oh you know why this guy is still answering phones like this isn't you know where yeah. I want to be I want to be with the big guy and it really that would have been a mistake and I'm glad that I had had enough experience to know that that was the right situation for me yeah well it's, it's funny I don't know anybody who answers phones at some point that doesn't end up in a big position <laughs> You it know, just seems that that's the way. You know, you got to do it. And the thing is, is that when I was answering phones, it was like, you know, I did a good job. 
I, it wasn't like I was, oh, well, you know, I, this is just until I do something else. You know, I tried to be the best assistant that I could be. And in every position you have, I think it's you have to be the best at that position. And then people don't see you like that. Mm. Um, you know, I certainly know that from my experience with my own assistants. Very cool. And so um, when would you say was, and of course, you, you technically broke in already, but you had to kind of re-break in in some ways. Um, what, what, what was your kind of big break that got you full-time into staff writing? You know, my first real big break was on My Name is Earl. And I had been working for you know, a couple of years on other things. So I worked on the Orlando Jones show, which was a short-lived late night show. I worked on Blue Collar TV, which was a sketch show on WB. I worked on a Nickelodeon live action show. I worked on an MTV reality dating show, Date My Mom. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I was really never above anything. I was never like, you know what, Jeff Foxworthy is a, really an amazing person, a very nice guy. But like, that's not really my cup of tea. You know, I wouldn't say that uh -huh. I moved to Hollywood and that, that, that he was my muse or anything, uh -huh. um, but every job you really learn something. You learn about what it takes to be in the room, it, you know, just that feeling of just pitching something and having it just totally bomb, you know, mm -hmm. and how do you recover from that and how do you, you know, ingrain yourself with the right people, you know, how do you, you know, deal with, you know, the higher ups, how do you deal with the other people at your level, just all of those things were such great training and then when the opportunity came, but when I finally had the really right sample, mm -hmm. Um, and it was a great year, um, that year in development. There was My Name is Earl, How I Met Your Mother, um, Everybody Hates Chris, and The Office was back after having just like a six episode mini for a season. Mm -hmm. And it was such a great time for staffing. And I met with all these people and the My Name is Earl pilot was the best pilot I'd ever seen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Greg Garcia told me in our meeting that he wanted to hire me wow. and I was ready. I mean, and it wasn't, you know, and I think to some of my friends at the time, you know, they thought like, oh, I just got so lucky. And it was like, no, I'd been working <laughs> for years on these shows that like, you know, didn't impress anybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nobody was excited about, not even my parents watched, you know, yeah. um, so that I was ready for that moment when that perfect thing came up and I got to work on at that point what was my dream show. Yeah, well, and that's really important for people to hear that, that uh, so many people come to Hollywood thinking that their dream opportunity is just going to drop in their lap. Yeah. And uh, number one, that doesn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> but number two, you wouldn't be ready for it if, if it did. Yeah. I mean, I really like, I always say that to people, you know, where, you know, you see and they're just so, so excited and they want to get staffed and they want this so bad. And it's just, you know, especially now you have a lot of staff writers who are a lot older mm -hmm. than it used to be. You know, you have a lot of staff writers, I mean, most of which I think are in their 30s, you know, and it's not like a 22 year old that comes and sits in the room and you don't feel like they have to contribute. And having just staffed a show, you know, you need everybody to contribute. Mm -hmm. And so you're really expected to have a lot under your belt, especially now with doing YouTube videos is doing funny or die stuff you're expected to have a lot under your belt before you ever step in the writer's room which is a different there's no apprenticeship anymore well and, and do you think it's fair to say I mean I think compared to say 10 years ago television now is a lot more sophisticated than it used to be do you think you you perhaps need a little, little more age in the room now I think so I mean you know to me it's I mean, I would never discriminate. Like if I read somebody young who was really great and really I felt like just had an amazing like point of view and voice, you know, I would hire them. But I, I do like that somebody has done some other things, maybe had a different type of job, maybe had a different kind of career. And, you know, you're writing for characters that are not TV writers, you know, <laughs> um, on most shows. Uh, so, you know, to have somebody that has, has something else to draw from, I think can just be really, really valuable in the room. Very, very cool. So c coming back to My Name is Earl, yeah. you were on from just after the pilot all the way to the end. Yeah. I so was there that for must all have been seasons. a great kind of master's program for, for writing. It was great, especially working with Greg Garcia, who really mm -hmm. is an incredible showrunner and is also, you know, he's so he's so supportive. He puts together a great staff, but he's hard. You know, it's not like he's the easiest to work for. He can be hard. Um, but I think that that was a great and a great environment to learn and really, you know, really just realize like what it took to kind of become a showrunner. Mm. And, you know, I think some people, you know, you get in there and you're like, I don't want that job, you know? And then, you know, to me, I was like, I do want that job, but I know I'm really, really not close to being ready for it. Yeah.
Very cool. And that was when you had your first overall deal? I did. I got my first overall deal when I was working on Earl, and I was pretty low-level writer at the time, but, mm -hmm. you know, Greg had read an original pilot that I wrote when I got the job, and he really told all the studios, like, I think that she has a show in her. Wow. And it meant something from him. And what was great is I didn't ask him to do that. I didn't, you know, the, the best help that you can ever get is you won't even know it's mm. happening, you know? It's just behind the scenes, and, you know, he really believed in me, you know, even before I probably even believed that I had a show in me, mm. he did. Very, very cool. And and that begins something, um, of course, you did work on community as well, but especially when you have an overall deal, there's a lot of behind the scenes work that happens that you'll never see on IMDb, yeah. where you're, you're creating pilot after pilot after pilot. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that happening at the same time as doing your full-time job. Yeah, you know, that that makes it tough because you have somebody who's running your show who's really championing you, and um, and then also at Sony, Tal Rabinowitz, who's now the head of comedy at NBC, we know was working there, and had, I had met with her when I was way early in, in my career, and it was one of my first general meetings, and she just really, you know, we had a connection, and she never forgot, and then when she was in the position and the timing was right, and you had somebody like Greg Garcia telling her bosses that it was worth making a deal kind of made that happen. But yeah, so all of a sudden you go from, you know, your life is the show and you've just been putting everything into the show to now having to go out on lunch breaks and pitch to networks and developing all the, you know, mm. this different ideas and things not working and, you know, you know, working for a month on something and then having it thrown out and, you know, it's it's a, adds a whole other layer. It really becomes like all of a sudden you have an extra weekend job. And that's how it was at the beginning. And my first pilot I developed with the Russo brothers, mm -hmm. who um, just did Captain America, a wow. Winter Soldier, I know, which is, I'm so proud of them, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, I had no doubt that they would, you know, become that, but it's so cool. Um, and, you know, that was a really positive experience developing with them. And, you know, but it came, it came so close, it came to like, you know, they said it was gonna get picked up and then it didn't. And it was like that harsh reality of, wow, you can put all of this time and energy into something and then just in one phone call, it's just gone. Wow. And, you know, those things rarely ever, they'll tell you they're going to get revived, but they really rarely ever get revived. Mm. And then you start from scratch the next year. And it's really daunting and mm. it can really wear on you. And, you know, you, you know, you kind of think like your mind is just blank after that that season of development, and then all of a sudden a month later the studio is calling you saying, "What's your next idea? Wow. You know, so what else are we gonna do? Yeah. Um, here's this book. Read this book. Like try this. Like we want to adapt this. Like what about this? And you know, making those decisions of do you develop with directors? Do you develop with an actor? Do you you know develop with another writer supervising you? Do you go with a known showrunner? You know, um, do you take an idea that's maybe been sitting around at one of the networks for a while and try to make at work, you know, mm. it's it's all these decisions all of a sudden are thrown at you, and you know, you really get if you're working full time on a show, pretty much one shot a year at making something happen. Mm. Now, um, tell me just just briefly, how many pilots would you say you wrote versus how many you sold versus how many were produced and how many got on the air? Okay, I'll try to go through it. Right. <laughs> um, I Let's see. I wrote my first original pilot as a sample, mm -hmm. um, which you know, which did well for me because it was very different at the time than any shows that were on the air. It was about a talking deer head that solved crimes. <laughs> so it was a good, you know, it's really it's so important to have you know, a script in your arsenal that is totally different than everything mm. else. Yeah. So I had like an Everybody Loves Raymond and I had a Scrubs and then all of a sudden had this other one that was totally different, which was better for like Comedy Central shows or that mm. kind of thing. So that showed that I could do something that was totally different. Yeah. Um, then I wrote a script that really came from after a breakup. It was really, I poured everything into where I just felt like I want this script to be what is exactly my voice. And it took a, it took a while to do and I just worked on some other shows until I got that and that was my my second pilot and that's really what's opened like every door for me was mm. that one pilot script and I still go on meetings and people have read that script my agent still sends it to <laughs> young writers to read wow. um, and so neither of those have been made or sold mm -hmm. and then the next pilot I wrote was the first pilot um, under my deal mm. um, and that sold 
um, and there was a bidding war over that, so it sold to multiple networks. Um, that was when it came close to going, didn't. Then, because that, I'm going to go into the specifics because I think that yeah, people watching sure. are interested, yeah. <laughs> um, hopefully. But because there had been a bidding war and because I had very successful development at ABC that year, they wanted to preemptively make a deal for the next pilot the next year. So Interesting. they made a deal with me where I still had to go into the head of comedy at the time, kind of pitch over breakfast, like the general kind of area, and then she signed off, but I didn't go wide pitching the idea. Interesting. So it was, you know, so that can really be helpful. If you have, somebody has a good, it's why it's always important that you maintain a good relationship with all these executives. It's really easy to get a hothead, and if you don't like what somebody's saying, just kind of be like, oh no, this is my art and this is whatever, but you have to always think about the long game. Mm. And if something is, if that script isn't gonna work out, where are you gonna be the next year? So then it was great because I got to develop a project within the next year that didn't come as close. They wanted me to develop a multi-camera project, which I've never worked on a multi-cam before. Mm. It was probably a mistake for me at that time. Yeah. Um, but you know, they they really wanted to make that work. There was a large penalty against it, so that made the studio happy because you're all of a sudden pleasing different people. Mm. Um, and so having a penalty can be really important if you're under an overall deal. Right. Um, and then the next year, I developed with Adam Scott. Um, and his wife, um, Naomi Scott, who's mm -hmm. an amazing producer. Um, and that was when I was at NBC, and in the middle of being there, the president left, <laughs> and oh, a new president oh, came in. Yeah. And you know, so then you're just kind of like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> and I was working on community, so we were living at the office. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, that made it a little bit more complicated. Um, and then the next year, I wrote another script for NBC. Um, at that point, the woman, Tal Rabinitz, who had gotten my overall deal really at Sony, started mm. was then the head of comedy at NBC which is also great you never know where somebody's gonna end up she was yeah. you know an assistant at Warner Brothers I think when I first met her I don't know if she had even been promoted to director yet wow. or had just been promoted but still had, was also answering I mean it was something yeah. like that very early in her career then when she got to NBC she brought me over and that was the first pilot that I had made um, that was about a pharmaceutical company and so it was just like kind of every year every little bit of something kind of helped get me to that place. And then once you get that first pilot shot, um, you know, it really makes a difference after that of how mm. people start to consider you. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. So quite, quite a few written, a few sold, but what it was, the first one was shot, that's when you were really on the... Yeah, and you know, yeah. what's, what's interesting is the year that that one was shot, I knew I was gonna go to NBC. I had taken the idea to NBC and ABC, which I had obviously, at that point, it would have been my third year developing with ABC, but because I had this great connection who was now at NBC, decided to go to NBC, then they threw out the idea. Mm. And so they bought the idea in the room, then threw it out about a month into development. Wow. And I had to come up with a new, whole new show idea. Um, which was a lot of pressure, and then that one ended up getting shot. But that's why you also have to be willing to let go of something, because mm. at a certain point we were redeveloping it so much, and I felt like there was still an idea that was really there, and ABC had wanted to buy it, yeah. and so I thought, I said, you know what, I think that we should let this idea go. I'm not worried about not having another idea, so let's come up with something else, and that ended up really being the right thing to get wow. into that kind of next level of getting it shot. Yeah, that, that, that old expression in the room, that ship has sailed. Yes. Um, we really have to follow that because the, the best idea might be right after that. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, so that one was shot, didn't go to series, but then, I, and I don't want to really skip over community, but I think uh, there's something more exciting in the room right now, uh -huh. which is the show that's actually airing this week. Yes, yes, Bad Teacher. So, um, you know, so it was great. So after having the year of development, making a pilot teaches you a lot. And I was really ready for developing Bad Teacher the next year. And, you know, my friends wrote the movie, Lee Eisenberg and Gene Stepnitsky. And I always thought it was such a great concept for a movie. And even though I didn't think that exactly the story from the movie really translated to a TV show, I really thought the concept mm. did. And so, you know, I took it to uh, you know CBS and it was just kind of like here we you know here we go it's like bad teacher it's a great title but like we've reworked and you know the kind of story and are laying out kind of something that we think you know can become more of an ensemble comedy and um, and, it, and it was great and it was such a positive development experience with CBS mm -hmm. from the very beginning they just believed in the show right away so so did you approach Gene and Lee and and pitch it to them to take 
to make a TV show out of it? Or no, actually, you know, they they had mentioned to me. Lee is one of my best friends. He yeah. had mentioned to me that they were thinking about making it into a TV show, and I kept saying like, okay, well, but I think you should do this, and I think you should do this. And then after months of kind of every time I saw him saying like, oh, I was thinking about it, and you should do this, he finally was like, would you want to write this? <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, and I said, yeah, I think I would. But I said, you know, are you guys open to me really reworking it? Because to me, what I loved about the movie was a concept everybody can relate to a bad teacher, mm. and I liked the archetypes because. Yeah. The archetypes were these very uh, relatable kind of. We all had that kind of bumbling principal. We all had, you know, that that teacher. We just thought, how does she even get out of bed in the morning? Like, what yeah. is, you know? We had, you know, the kind of like cute gym coach. You know, it, there was just these kind of great characters that everybody could connect with. And I wanted to just kind of let go of what their backstories were um, because you just you just need different kind of engines for a TV show than you do for a ninety minute movie. Hmm. And they were very open to that. Yeah, and and. and Tell me as well about um, it was an R-rated movie. Yeah. But the the TV show is family friendly. So how do you make that transition? You know, the TV show isn't really family friendly. It's edgy, but you know, it's um, but it's PG thirteen. I mean, mm. the thing is, is that you can never do an R rated movie on you know uh, on a on a network show. Mm. Um, and so that was a, that was really a big part of redeveloping the show too, of that of really grounding it. Mm. Because if you know you can't have the teacher smoking a, a bong, you know, in front yeah. of students or whatever. I mean, uh, we have her smoking a bong in the pilot, but, you know, not in front of students, you know, you can't take it to the extreme level you can in a rated R movie. She can't say the F word. So you really have to ground it so that the comedy is coming from a different kind of level of inappropriateness. <laughs> you know? yeah. mm -hmm. Which teachers have a lot of different inappropriate things they can do. Exactly. You know, I mean, I had te a teacher that in high school that like would cry in seventh class. I mean, you're just like, that's inappropriate. But if you know, you have to make sure that the rest of the world isn't so heightened that that doesn't work. So if the world right. is grounded and pretty real, then that can work. So that was really the challenge of keeping the world really grounded and real. Hmm. And your slot is 930, so you can get away with a little more than 8 o'clock. Yeah, exactly. So we're, we're able to be edgy. I mean, she's out there looking for kind of a, a new rich husband is kind of the story. And she kind of doesn't stop at, you know, anything to try to make that happen. And so we're able to have the fun of being in a 930 slot. Um, but we're, you know, we're able to like, be able to translate the concept, you know, to a still network show. Mm -hmm. And and before we move on, in, anything about it that you you would like to talk about uh, either the the room, the the writers that you're working with, or or in terms of the content of the show, what you would want people to know? You know, I mean, well, I have to say the writers were amazing on the staff, and you know, I was so lucky to have them. I mean, it's just it's so exciting when you're working on a pilot all by yourself and. It's, with your cats and it's depressing, you know? Um, and then all of a sudden you have a room full of people that are helping you solve problems, helping you come up with great things, uh, you know, details of each character is really amazing. And, you know, in this show, Ari Grainer is just an amazing, like, lead. But then to have an ensemble around her where, you know, every person I meet thinks that somebody is a different get. You know, they'll be like, oh my God, Ryan Hansen is so hilarious and party uh -huh. down. I can't believe you got him. And then somebody else will be like, I've seen every episode of Sex in the City. I can't believe you got Kristen Davis, or you know, Roseanne was my favorite show of all time. And you got Sarah Gilbert, or like so many of my guy friends freak out about David Allen Greer. I mean, it just is to have all of these big comedy hitters, but that are so different from each other. Mm. Um, being able to like come together and they, they work so well together, um, which you know, you know, <laughs> you're never sure about. Uh, yeah. But in this case, they happen to work really well together, and that was really exciting. It, it must be a really fun room because I'm sure everybody's got high school stories. Yeah, mm -hmm, for sure. Everybody has, you know, a story about a teacher, you know, whether they're they're bad or sad or just um, inappropriate or whatever. And that was really fun to kind of hear people's uh, hear people's stories. And it's just, I mean, school, everybody can relate to school. I mean, everybody knows what it's like to sit in one of those little desks and get a little chocolate milk. And, you know, that's, yeah. that's the best part no matter what age you are. Very cool. So April 24th, 9.30 p.m. on CBS. Uh, definitely got to check that out and, and share about that. Make sure that lots of people are watching. Yes. But mo moving on, our last little section here is writing tips. Now, you've, you've done all levels. You've done pilots. You've done um, network shows. You've done um, lots of stuff along the way. You've seen from the perspective of an, assist, uh, of an assistant. Um, what are some general tips, either things that you think are, are crucial for somebody to know to succeed or perhaps pitfalls to avoid 
um, in breaking in and, and working as a writer? Yeah, I think like kind of what we were talking about of that, you know, you have to be ready for the opportunities when they present themselves. And that, you know, the desire to want to do something is way different than the readiness. Mm. And so, you know, to me, always, you know, the most successful writers that I've met are people who really took their time getting somewhere and knowing when to pass on an opportunity. You know, I think that one of the problems now with as much access as everybody has, like with, you know, Hulu and um, now Yahoo, like coming into it, you know, where they're looking for content. Um, one, they're looking for content usually, you know, with not protecting the writers. You know, a lot of times, like if those are not WGA, the writers are not protected. And so you, you know, sometimes it's hard to like look a gift horse in the mouth, but somebody will give you an opportunity that you're really not ready for. So somebody I know might write a pilot that's just starting out and somebody is like, yeah, we want to make this. And it's like, okay, but you know, you have to think of, are they going to bring on another writer that is going to executive produce it with you? Um, who could then take the show over from you? You know, if you're not able to show run at that point, then you can end up with like a lot of writers where they're creators of the show, but they maybe only have a producer credit. Mm -hmm. um, if it's that high, I mean, they're not the final decision maker. So you can have a real vision for something, but kind of nobody cares. Yeah. Um, and so it's just like, there's all these opportunities now, but sometimes really knowing exactly what you want means turning down something when it's right in front of you. And when I was coming up was when, you know, sitcoms were dying and reality TV was really king. And I knew a lot of people that ended up taking kind of jobs on reality shows or, you know, different kinds of things. Like, oh, well, I'm just going to do this thing. I'm just going to write a little treatment for this or I'm going to try to sell this. And, you know, and some, some succeeded in kind of getting the quick kind of sale of something, getting the ability to kind of, you know, call back home and and say, you know, oh, I sold this and this mm -hmm. is exciting. But it was really taking them away from their ultimate goal. And the people I know that really stuck to, um, this is what I know I want to do. Like, you you know, do you want to write movies or do you want to write TV? You know, because they're different and they're different tracks. Mm -hmm. And really focused um, are the people that are still here. Yeah. Now, now, you mentioned a few times that there was somebody that you had met when they were an assistant and now they were this. When you walk into a room and you meet the assistant, are you being strategic in your thinking, or, or, <laughs> or what goes on in your mind when when you meet people? Um, you know, you know, to me, it's like you should always be nice to everybody. I mean, you know, it's and I've luckily, you know, when I was an assistant, I always had great bosses, and they've always been supportive. And you know, I've had bosses call me and just tell me congratulations of where I ended up. But you just really don't know what people's stories are, what they're going to do, and I mean, I mean. And again, you should be nice to everybody, no matter what, <laughs> whether you think they're going to end up, you know, somewhere or not. But I think that it's always important to remember that Hollywood is constantly changing and things are constantly flipping. And it's one of the best things about the business. I mean, Mark Cherry is always talking about how he went from living off his residuals to then creating Desperate Housewives. And, you know, you can reinvent yourself. And so, you know, you just have to always be aware of everything is not going to be the way it is right now forever. You know, right now it's like I'm a showrunner of a show. It's great. You know. I hopefully, hopefully it'll be a huge hit on on Thursday, the 24th at 930. Um, but, you know, you never know. And so I might be right back to the drawing board, you know, selling another show in the summer. And, you know, you always have to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. and, and so speaking about selling a show, and we'll probably end af after this, but um, you've written a whole bunch of pilots, you've sold a few, and you've learned along the way kind of what sells. Um, w what would you say are some crucial elements of, of selling a pilot? What has to be on the page that, that will make it strike interest? You know, the number one thing is what has to be on the page is something that only you can bring to it. And I think that that is, even if you're writing a show about aliens and it's not obviously from a personal life story, I mean, maybe it is, <laughs> but a personal life story, it's coming up with what is your connection? You know, what is your life experience that has brought you to this point that makes you feel like there's something special in telling this story? Um, that somebody else that walks in, if they had that same, that same idea, it wouldn't be good enough. It wouldn't come close to what you're going to bring to this project. And I think that no matter how high concept what you want to do is, you can always find that element in it. Even in Bad Teacher pitching it, you know, I started with telling a story about one of my high school teachers. And, you know, even though this was a movie, you know, adapted from a movie, and obviously I didn't come up with the original premise, but it was like trying to tie it back to why I had something special to say about this and mm. why I wanted to write, write this world. 
And I think that that's absolutely hands down the number one thing and the difference between a successful pitch and an unsuccessful one. Wow. Well, that is a great place to end up. And I wish you every success. I hope that uh, that bad teacher ends up being longer run than my name is Earl in <laughs> yes, community. Thank you. Me too. <laughs> yeah. Um, and good luck with the baby as well. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Well, um, we'll end it here and uh, and make sure to watch Thursdays 9:30 on CBS. Bad teacher. And thanks, Hillary Winston, for joining us. Do you have a Twitter handle that people could follow? I do. It's just Hillary Winston. Just Hillary Winston. Yeah. Great. So everybody follow Hillary on Twitter, and. Uh, and we'll see on Thursdays at 9.30. Great, thank you. Okay. Visit tvwriterpodcast.com for tons of resources, including a TV Writer Twitter database with over a 1,000 writers, links to hundreds of free TV scripts, pilots, and Bibles. You can find the audio-only versions of this podcast through the Script Magazine iTunes feed. You can also find the video version at plenty of places, iTunes, blip.tv, YouTube, tvwriterpodcast.com, and of course at scriptmag.com. I want to thank this week's sponsors, Total Training, thousands of hours of online training at totaltraining.com, Rode Microphones at roadmic.com, Think Tank, camera bags and accessories at thinktankphoto.com, Indie System, affordable U.S.-made camera support gear at indiesystem.com, Red Giant Software Effects Plugins at RedGiant.com Elgato, makers of ITV computer-based DVRs at Elgato.com For information on how you can advertise your product, service, or yourself for as little as $30, visit TVWriterPodcast.com and click on Advertise. Thanks for joining me. Look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye. Hosted by Gray Jones, the TV Writer Podcast is brought to you by Script Magazine and ScriptMag.com, the leading source for script writing information in print and on the web.